Yeah. Uh, Mr. Verhofstadt, uh, I'm Stevie Young from CNBC International. On Monday, the new UK envoy to the EU, Sir Tim Barrow, said that the UK can complete the negotiations for a new trading relationship with the EU within the two-year Brexit timetable. Are you as confident? Um, the, 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 the timetable is, uh, is uh, I think, extremely clear. So we need, uh, we uh, will have two years uh, to uh, agree on an, uh, a withdrawal agreement, uh, including uh, the framework of the future relationship. Uh, that's exactly what the treaty is uh, saying. Uh, and on top of that also, uh, if necessary, a number of transition arrangements. And um, then the transition period uh, will be used to um, conclude the details of the future relationship. And that can take two years, three years, four years, depending on how long the transition period is. Uh, so I hope that uh, the, the withdrawal agreement and the future framework uh, can be done within the, the two years, because in fact it's not two years, it's less than two years. If the negotiation starts by the end of May or the beginning of June, it has to be finished by October, November, because in November has to start then the consent procedure in the European Parliament. And the consent procedure in the European Parliament will take also four or five months so that everything can be done before um, the European elections uh, of uh, 2019. That's the time frame uh, that, uh, in which we work. Uh, Nicola Borazer, European Western Balkans web portal. My first question would be, uh, you frequently mentioned the need for unity in the European Union. Uh, mm -hmm. Where do you see the Western Balkans in this vision of Europe you have? And the second question is, how do you see the Russian and Turkish influences in the Western Balkans when it comes to the level of democracy? Thank you. Well, I, I think it's absolutely necessary that we, uh, in the European Union, re-engage uh, with the uh, accession process uh, of all countries of the Western Balkan. Um, Let's be honest that uh, since a few years now, uh, after uh, the entrance uh, yeah, of, uh, of Croatia, it has been a, a period of uh, slowing down, in my opinion, this whole process. And I think it's a very bad thing, uh, because uh, it's absolutely key, in my opinion, that all Western Baltic countries uh, are entering in the European Union. Um, including uh, Montenegro, Macedonia, Serbia, uh, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina. Why? Because it is the only and the best way to stabilize the region. Uh, and it seems to me a better way to stabilize the region than to putting, uh, as we still do, uh, European soldiers on the ground. Uh, so uh, I'm very much in favor to further promote uh, the uh, entrance of the Western Balkan countries inside the European Union uh, and to do the necessary efforts for that from our side, but also from the side of the Western Balkan countries, naturally, uh, who have to uh, adopt, uh, reform the institutions towards the, the standards of the European Union, the so-called uh, criteria of Copenhagen. And that's also the best way to secure a European future for the Western Balkans instead of the growing influence, as you have indicated, uh, from Russia or from Turkey. Um, the next question is over, over there. Okay, hi, I'm Sarah Yana from the Christian Science Monitor. Um, we summed up the last session basically by saying it's a different world, and I just wanted your opinion on where the, you know, how the European Union will respond to that and how much you see the multi-speed Europe as you know, the future for the bloc. <laughs> Uh, about multi-speed Europe, I'm going to not tell a lot because we have a multi-speed Europe today. I'm always saying, I, I was right, in my book, I'm, I'm advocating the fact that there exist 28 unions for the moment. So every, every country pick and choose his own policies for the moment. So I think that the Brexit uh, negotiations are a good opportunity also to reform the European Union and to put an end to what I call this uh, uh, Europe a la carte, like the French are saying, this uh, possibility for member states to pick and choose their policies. That doesn't mean that uh, there cannot be a core of countries going forward uh, with the integration of the European Union. 
And a more integration of the European Union doesn't mean to create a super state in Europe. It means that uh, instead of having a bureaucratic uh, union uh, with a big commission, uh, every day putting new regulations uh, uh, out, uh, we need more uh, a Europe, maybe small institutions, uh, a real European small government producing real European capacities and European policies. We don't need more regulation. What we need is more, for example, European border and coast guard to manage Schengen. We need a European defense union to pick up our responsibility in our neighborhood. We need to have a real European governance of the Eurozone, of the single currency, because in my opinion, a state can maybe exist without a currency, but I don't think that the currency can exist without a state. Julian Barnes, Wall Street Journal. Um, the uh, relations with Turkey are at a low point right now. Can That's they... an understatement, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, really the understatement of the day. <laughs> Can they be fixed as long as Erdogan is in power? How do you think the EU-Turkey deal is at risk? Well, it's difficult to respond to that question. The only thing what I know is that uh, I made an uh, appeal in the European Parliament last week uh, to freeze the negotiation of accession, at least. To freeze the uh, negotiation uh, on the accession of, uh, to the European Union, because yeah, you cannot, at, at, at the one hand, have the tensions, uh, the lack of trust, uh, the opposition uh, on principles uh, between uh, the European Union at the one hand and the Turkish authorities at the other hand, and then do uh, as nothing is happening and continue accession negotiations. So I did an appeal to freeze uh, this also as a sign to indicate that accession to the European Union needs first of all uh, the respect of basic uh, democratic principles, human rights and the rule of law. And it is not guaranteed today. I have to tell you I was always a very big uh, advocate of the entrance of Turkey uh, in the uh, uh, European Union, uh, certainly for the last 15 years. But you have to face the reality. The reality is that uh, the Turkish, uh, uh, Turkey as, as such has not come more closer to the European Union and the criteria of Copenhagen, but on the country has uh, drifted away from it. And certainly the uh, uh, situation of, uh, of many journalists uh, in jail, uh, not having the possibility uh, to practice their profession, uh, is proof uh, uh, of that. So before claiming uh, the possibility, uh, and I'm in favor of that, that uh, uh, whatever Turkish politician can come to Europe to uh, explain his point of view, maybe it should be also a good thing that they liberate uh, the, the journalists uh, who are uh, under threats or, or in prison today in, in Turkey before asking and requesting themselves uh, the possibility uh, of freedom of speech in Europe. I can take the last one. I have to, uh, to leave. Sorry. So I have, <laughs> sorry that I, that I have overtaken your job. Oh, so. Sorry about that. Mr. Verhofstadt, um, I just wanted to ask you, the professor alluded to it um, at the end of the plenary there, the link between sort of social exclusion and the rise of populism. Yeah. Um, some experts also say there's a link between social exclusion and the rise of terrorism. And we know that terrorism is a big issue, continues to be here um, involving EU citizens. What, what do you think the solution is? Is there a solution? Well, uh, the f a fight against terrorism is, is, uh, uh, is, uh, is in absolutely need, and that means uh, a number of measures, certainly on the level of security on the level of the management of our borders or the, uh, and, and, and also uh, of uh, the internal inequalities in our societies, yes. But I think it's a, uh, it, it means a lot of, uh, of, uh, of policies that we have uh, to uh, develop. But let's not, uh, uh, let's not forget that um, the main uh, source for terrorism today is jihadism and has been, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, created uh, by, yeah, but everything what has happened in the Syrian conflict, 
just before the Syrian conflict and uh, because of the Syrian conflict. Uh, IS didn't exist at the beginning of the Syrian revolution. The Syrian revolution was a revolution like in Tunisia, like in Egypt, like in Libya, exactly the same. And we didn't do anything to help the moderate forces in Syria. So then you create a vacuum, and that vacuum was filled in by whom? By IS, not only in Iraq, but also in Syria. So the combination of an Iraq war, who was not justified, because I was very pleased with uh, the lady, former member of the Congress, who was saying, yeah, uh, 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 I recognize now that it was wrong and there were no weapons of mass destruction. I remember you that I was Prime Minister of Belgium. I was one of the only countries after the meetings with Mr. Blix. You remember Mr. Blix, the Swedish uh, representative of the UN, who was indicating to me every time there are no weapons of mass destruction. Nevertheless, we enter in Iraq, and I think that was one of the big mistakes. And the second big mistake was not to, to do nothing at all when it was a real uh, popular, I should say, revolution or revolt in, in Syria. And that created uh, yeah, the most awful uh, jihad uh, Sunni uh, uh, organization that uh, exists and that we have to fight again. But let's not forget that uh, um, yeah, there is a, a part of responsibility uh, in, in, in our weakness and in our wrong choices in the past who is responsible for it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.